Hi everybody, welcome back. Before we get started on our next part of our current project, I want to address a couple things with you. First of all, uh, it seems like I have to bring this up probably every two or three months because if you don't go back and watch some of the earlier videos, you might miss some of the things that I put up. So with that said, a little bit of background. Uh, I do not do this for a living, working on these stereos. It's just a hobby, and I do it in my spare time, which I don't always have a lot of. Uh, you have to understand, I own a full-time business with employees, and it takes a lot of my time. I work in the medical imaging industry, so we service and sell medical imaging equipment, such as x-ray machines and digital x-ray products, ultrasound units, mammography, CAT scanners, all those kinds of things. We service and sell a lot of different products. So you can imagine how much time it takes, especially with the current health situation that's going on in our country and throughout our world. Um, my key first you know, thing that I need to concern myself with is the health and welfare of my employees. And uh, in addition to that, I have a family. And of course, my obligation is always first and foremost to them. And I even have a grandchild on the way, which is good news. But what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of things that, uh, that I'm involved in that I have to do. And I get probably 40 or 50 emails every single week from all of you, which I love. Being able to help you guys and share information back and forth with one another is my form of relaxation. It's what I like to do. But you got to understand, when you get that many emails every week and you only have a very limited amount of time, it can take me two or three weeks to get back to you. Uh, now that a lot of us are home, <laughs> like we should be, uh, I think sometimes people get a little anxious. They send an email and they want an answer right away from me. And when I don't answer right away, they get very offended. Well, let me assure you that the last thing that I want to do is offend any of you and that I will try to answer almost every email that I can. Now, understand, if there's some rude or inappropriate uh, content in your email, I'm not answering you. Second of all, I'm not really interested in, in paid promotions or advertisements. That's not what I have this channel for. Third of all, I don't have a Patreon account. Um, I'm not doing this to make money. Uh, I do this because I like to do it. The day that it stops being something that I like to do is the day that I will stop doing it. So really, this is about sharing information with one another, meeting some new friends, which I've met a lot of new friends through this channel, and uh, being able to work on the type of equipment that I love. And that's what I'm doing. So. Understand, don't take it personally if I can't answer your email right away. There are things that are important in my life that I have to address before your piece of audio equipment or your question. I want to answer your question and I will try to do so um, in a timely manner, but I can't always guarantee it's going to be right away. Last of all, I can't really take on any new projects and I said this in my frequently asked questions video. I don't have the time to be a repair service for people to send in their equipment to repair. As much as I would enjoy that, that would be like a dream come true. I just can't do it <laughs> between the business, the family, and all the other obligations. So what you see me do here in these videos is really all that I ever get to do. It's all I have time to do. And it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I like sharing it with you. And, I, and if you guys enjoy it as well, that's great. You know, a lot of channels, they do the, oh, be sure to like and subscribe and all that. I don't really care about that. If you want to like a video or dislike it, that's up to you. And if you want to subscribe, that's wonderful. But if you don't, I understand. You know, this is not about collecting anything. <laughs> it's about I enjoy doing it. So I hope you all understand that. I hope that clears the air with that. And uh, probably every couple of months, I need to kind of put this at the beginning of a video to remind all of the new viewers and people um, of all of these things I just brought to your attention.
So with that being said, let's get back to our LR441. We're going to try to work with the tuner on this video. And I am going to try to share some information that I did on a previous video, but I've had a few questions about it because um, I showed something in, my, in a couple videos ago <laughs> that piqued some curiosities. So maybe we'll add a little bit about that subject into this as well. So without further ado, let's get back to it. So since last time that uh, we left off, I've gone through and I recapped the tone control section and I removed this. This is actually a two-part two module here. In the front, these are all the selector switches to select the auxiliary and the tuner and phono and so forth. So this is your, your input selection. And then the back portion of this board is actually your phono stage. So this is the section where you're going to have your RIAA curve and where you're going to have your preamplifier. So we're going to go ahead and recap that, obviously, and check it out and make sure everything's good. While I was in here, I noticed one of the lights was out, and they were these little fuse lamp type things. The one here on this side was out, so you couldn't even tell there were two meters in here. There's a signal strength meter, and then there's the tuning centering meter. So the centering meter is here. This one was still lit up, so you could see it in the last video. So I've replaced these lights, and these are blue lights, which are similar color to the lenses in there, and uh, they should look pretty nice in there. Uh, the incandescent ones look really nice as well, but uh, these will be okay. The other thing is we'll never have to deal with them anymore. And this just kind of, you have a bracket with two screws, and this slides right in here, so we'll put that back in. But the bigger issue is going to be how tight all of this wiring is in here. We're going to have to get this apart to a point in which we can get to these components to replace them. So that's going to be a little bit tricky, and I'm going to have to do that off camera. But uh, just with some taking our time and being patient, we can get these things replaced. So that's what I'm going to work on now. And then uh, the rest of this video, we're going to focus on the tuning section of this receiver. Well, that's all put back together and ready to go. So now let's uh, move on to our tuner and see how it goes. Been a long day at work here, but I'm back and I thought I'd come down and play on the bench a little bit before this evening gets too late. And we cleaned up the faceplate. It cleaned up really well. And just some soapy dishwater, uh, you know, dish soap in some hot water and these knobs just they look brand new. So everything's ready to go here. We got the phono stage put back together. All the bulbs are good. And of course, if we plug it in now, we should be able to get some. And you can see everything's lit up now, finally. And it actually looks pretty good. So now let's move on to the tuner. As you can see, I'm set up to do uh, the alignment, the first alignment, in the service manual for the FM discriminator. Now, here's the problem. And this is something you're going to find. I get a lot of questions. How Can you just show me how to hook everything up um, and align my tuner? Well, it's not that easy. And the reason being is it really depends upon the procedure of the service manual. It depends upon the type of test equipment you personally have and the type of test equipment that the factory used when they made the procedure. This is a very good case in point. So for instance, very straightforward instructions. So for the FMIF alignment, the first thing they want you to do is set up your discriminator. And to do that, they want you to connect a 10.7 kilohertz sweep generator, and they're, <laughs> they actually mean megahertz. That's wrong. Through a ceramic capacitor and the ground lead to ground to TP5 on the receiver. Now, 
if you go to the next page, the next thing they tell you, that's pretty straightforward. So you have a sweep signal that's centered at 10.7 megahertz. The next thing they tell you, connect input of an oscilloscope directly to test point five on the receiver and the ground lead to chassis ground. No detector probe is necessary. So what they're saying is you just take your normal probe on your scope, connect it to the oscilloscope, and you're going to read right at that uh, output. Increase the sweep generator output until the output display on the scope just saturates. Then adjust both the upper and lower cores of T202 for straightness and symmetrical S curve at 10.7 megahertz. And you can see they marked it the correct way there. Uh, marker center. So they want a marker also. They don't just want a sweep signal, but they want a sweep marker generator. See figure two for the correct display. So they're showing you, and this is a very typical visual alignment of a discriminator with your S curve. Now here's where you run into a little bit of problem. If you have a standalone sweep generator, there, there are, it basically will put out that swept signal that goes above and below 10 megahertz. It will also inject what's called a marker, which is a continuous 10.7 megahertz signal. That marker is what you're going to use on your scope. See that right there is your 10.7. That's what's going to mark that you're at the center of the S curve. Because the idea is you want the discriminator to cut off above and below that 10.7 megahertz in, in a very symmetrical manner. That's what prevents you from getting distortion. Now, the problem you run into with this is there are different ways you can put that 10.7 megahertz marker in there. One is called a pre-marker, where you add the 10.7 megahertz signal from a separate continuous signal generator, and you attach it to your swept signal, and they are both together. The other type of test equipment is called a post marker. What is a post marker? Well, a post marker will only put this marker on your oscilloscope. It won't put it in the test point. So if you're not using the built-in test circuitry in your sweep analyzer or whatever test equipment you're using, you'll never see this sweep signal or this uh, marker here. So case in point, if we want to use our Sencor SG80, which was made for this job, it uses what's called a post marker. And what that means is you have your actual output. This is where the swept signal comes out of, but there's no marker here. It's just that sweep signal. Then you have an FM detector, which is picking up the signal of your discriminator and over here, it is imposing a 10.7 megahertz marker onto this signal here. That is then all being picked up and combined, and it's fed in an XY ma manner uh, out to your oscilloscope, and you put your oscilloscope in XY mode. When you do that, you can get a very clear looking S curve. The problem is if you follow the service manual, you will not be able to get that because our test equipment is different from the test equipment they are asking for. So you have to know your test equipment and you have to kind of adapt it. The other thing is they're telling you to, to put everything on TP5. Now, if you look right here, TP5 is directly after the discriminator. See there? Right there. If we hook up our test equipment like that, that's Sencor SG80. And by the way, I went over the SG80. It's all good now. Everything is on frequency. Everything is good. Uh, then you're not going to see what you need to see. So with the test equipment we have, we're going to inject the signal from the output into somewhere around here, like TP4 or TP3. I'm actually at TP3. And then we are going to put our detector probe at TP5, which is what we have down here. So you see TP3 
Here's our signal generator output. That's our sweep signal. Then we're picking it up after the discriminator right here with our detector probe. And then we're displaying it as an XY signal on our oscilloscope up here. We are then going to adjust that discriminator coil, which is right here, and there's an upper and lower core until we get a nice symmetrical signal. Now, here's the other problem you're going to run into, and that is when you go to the upper and lower cores, they're kind of close to one another. So you adjust, you'll adjust that top core up here, but there's another core below it. And if you notice, I had to cut this very short. I have this special tool made for this because if this thing is too long, it has to extend below the first core and then go into the second core. If it goes through both cores at the same time and turns them, it'll throw off all your adjustments. So you need a special tool to be able to do that unless you can reach from the underneath of the chassis and get to the bottom core, which sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. So now you see what I'm going to do here. So here is our signal. And I'm going to probably make you dizzy wobbling the camera. And if I turn this marker up, you can see the marker right here starting to show. There's a whole bunch of markers on this one, but the main 10.7 is right here. See it going up and down? See, it's the biggest of all the markers. So you don't want it to swamp the signal, but you want enough there that you can see it. Now, you can see it's the discriminator is not centered on 10.7 megahertz. So what's going to happen is if you listen to this radio right now, it's not going to sound its best. And beyond that, when you there probably will be another spot where you can tune. In other words, there'll be like two different spots on the dial that you'll that you'll be able to tune in that FM station. Kind of like a double station on one. So this is not good. We want to move this to the center. So to do that, we're going to adjust the core and hopefully this will work. And you can see what's happening. And right there, we're centered right on it. So now our 10.7 is good. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to kind of adjust this up and down a little bit until we're right over the center. And we want this and this to be very symmetrical on the, on the edge, and we want this slope to be nice and straight. You want to be able to take, take a ruler <laughs> and kind of hold it right here, and you should see a nice straight line, no curves in it. So that's what we're going to do. That's what our lower core is going to do. Now there's other ways, to, other procedures to do this same alignment, but this is a visual, visual alignment using uh, this SG-80. And by the way, if you have an SG-165, which is kind of the lower end model that's not digital, um, that's not synthesized frequency, it, it's the same procedure as this. So if you have an SG-165, this is the same thing. So now we're going to adjust the lower core, and you see what that does? It kind of, and we want it to be symmetrical, just like that. See that? In other words, we don't want one peak being bigger than the other. And it's a balancing act. You have to go between the two till you just get it perfect. And, uh, and once you do that, you're good to go. That looks pretty good right there. What do you think? So there's your markers. And they're all pretty much in the right place. They're pretty close. And if I turn the marker up now, you can see it getting bigger and smaller. And right there, and you can see the little pip. If you make it smaller, it makes it easier to center it on your center line. So there it is. Uh, now what you'll find is after you go through all of this, you still might have to go through and kind of hand tune it a little bit to get it perfect. You can actually use a distortion meter if you have it 
and you can align it that way as well. But we're not really going to get into that <laughs> right now. So anyway, that's just a rough idea of how you set up a discriminator with visual alignment using that type of test equipment and the difference between a pre-marker generator and a post-marker generator. Okay, so our big problem now is the dial accuracy is out. <clears throat> and again, using the test equipment that I have, uh, I'm not going to use the procedure in the manual. Uh, and part of the reason is because I, I have my own way of doing things. But what they actually have you do is you're going to go through and they're going to have you take a little piece of wire. Let me show you here. And this is again a very conventional method of doing something. You make a you take a piece of wire, you coil it up and you put it fit it over the top of this T103, which is just a little core right here in the front end. So T103 is going to be I think this one right here. So they'll you wrap a piece of wire around that. You connect it to your sweep marker generator and you inject your sweep signal. Then at the output of TP4, which is on the front end board again, you're going to build this little circuit. And you can see that it in, involves two capacitors one germanium diode and two resistors and then you come out and go into your oscilloscope and you will be able to see a signal that looks somewhat like these and the idea is you want to get a nice little dome or an inverted or a bell they call it a bell sometimes but you just want it to be nice and symmetrical like this and again we can do that but I'd rather than building that circuit and everything, I'll go through it the way that I do. So the first problem that we had was that the dial accuracy is out. So you can see right here, if I turn up the volume, I'm tuned in right now, and I'm sitting at about eh, somewhere around 91 megahertz. The problem is I have my signal generator set at exactly 90 megahertz. And if we go over to the oscilloscope, this scope is just looking at the tape recorder output, so it's actually looking at the decoded audio. And you can see it's very clean. We're not having any problems whatsoever with that. And uh, so that's good. The problem is it's wrong. <laughs> so how do we correct that? Well, what we want to do is we want to adjust the oscillator circuit. The oscillator is the circuit that works at the front end with your tuned RF to set your dial accuracy. Um, it's also required for a superheterodyne circuit. And I've talked about these things in other videos a lot. So how do we identify that? Well, first of all, the schematic shows it. Here's your tuning gang, and this, this tuning gang has all of the capacitors for the AM and FM. And if you notice, the AM ones are always going to have finer little uh, fins on it because they actually need higher capacitance because it's a lower frequency than FM. And if you notice, each one of these three gangs are your different stages of your RF front end. But there's one by itself here. It's a, it's a low capacitance one, and it's sitting all by itself. And this is going to be our little oscillator for the FM. And there's a fine trimmer capacitor on the top here that will set that range of that. So if we move this, it's going to move the, center, the section of the dial that you're going to go into. And you can see just me diddling around with this, I just noticed it threw off that station ever so slightly. So looking at how there's kind of some tarnish and crud on there, I'm thinking that maybe part of the problem here is just this may have just drifted off center a little bit. And you barely need to touch this. 
and it will greatly affect the signal. So if I just touch this, even move my finger near it, let me show you what happens. So here's my finger. I'm not even touching it. Look what happens to the channel. See that? Not even touching it. So what we're going to do is I have my signal generator set at 90 megahertz. I'm going to set my tuning gang at 90 megahertz right on. Okay, be as accurate as you can. Then we're going to go back to here and we're going to adjust this until we get a nice clear signal on there. Now the reason we adjusted the discriminator circuit first was to make sure we didn't have anything strange going on after it detects the, uh, the audio. That's one of the reasons they did it as well in the instructions. So here we go, we're on this and I'm using a non-metallic adjusting tool and I barely even move it and we'll see where we are. Here we go, see it starting to show up? Just very barely touching it, and there it is. And as soon as you take the tool off, you'll notice that it throws it off a little bit. And it's very touchy. So that there it is. Okay, and we're all done and it's right on 90 megahertz now. So that's really all that was wrong with this, um, to be honest, and the, the discriminator was a tiny little bit off, but I don't think that anybody touched it. I think the golden tweaker was only on the amplifier section from the last video, not from the tuner. So now we have a nice clean signal to work with, and we can go through and kind of fine tune things as we go along now. So. The next thing we want to do is we want to go through and adjust the coils and the capacitors so that we get a maximum peak. And you can still see we still have a tiny little bit of uh, dissymmetry here where it's a little bit more pointed here and a little bit more rounded here. And that again is our discriminator circuit that we can, we can fine tune that um, after we get through all of our other adjustments. So that's going to be the next thing we're going to do after we go through our IF section and our RF section and get it all tuned in properly. Okay, back up a second. I misspoke. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, I'm just going to leave this in the video and just correct it. So if we look at the schematic, on the front end here, this is where your tuner is, or where your uh, main tuning is. There are two devices here. There's a coil, T101, and there's a capacitor, CV101, and then you have CT101. So one of them is actually your tuning gang cap capacitor. The other one is actually the, uh, the trimmer, and then you have the actual coil. And essentially what you want to do is you want to adjust these the coils, all of the coils along here have more influence at the lower frequency band. So like at your 90 megahertz you would adjust this. At your 106 megahertz when you go to the top end of the dial you adjust all the capacitors. So I misspoke when I said you adjust the capacitors at the actual low end of the, of the dial. So that's what we did. So here we are at right at 90 megahertz and it would help if I got rid of that thing there and you can see we're right on 90 if we move over to 106 megahertz which is right about there and let's move our signal generator and you'll see as I approach 96 megahertz it's going to come right up or 106 megahertz, I'm sorry. And right there's 106, and I'm right on it just about. And you can see there it is. 
and that's pretty close. So, and you can see it's very sensitive. If I move the tuning dial the tiniest little bit, you can see that it kind of goes through here and drops out. There we go. So, you you can pick up the sideband. So, here's the sideband on one side. Here's the sideband on the other side. See how it crushes the top when you get above the band, this the channel, and it crushes the bottom when you get below the channel. That's normal. That's what you should be seeing. So that's pretty much what you want. So the next step is kind of a little bit of a tedious one. You have to go back and forth with your dial between 90 megahertz and 106 megahertz, back and forth. So when we adjust the 90 megahertz, we're going to adjust our coils. So that would be, for instance, it would be the coils such as T101, the little transformers, I should say, T102, T103, and so forth. Then when we go to our 106, and when it's done, we should be centered on the tuning dial, and we should have peak signal strength. And once again, we can drop our signal now quite a bit. And you can see we'll set it to right around there so it can peak out right there. We'll set it about 9. And that means everything is centered. When we're done, we then go up to 106 megahertz, which is the one thing I do not like about the SG80 is you have to turn the knob a million times, even in course adjustment, <laughs> to go from a low frequency to a high one. But we go up to here, and we go up to our 106, and you can see it just starts peaking out, and it's right on top of 106, and we can see we have maximum signal strength, and we're center of the tuning meter, and even though the camera is not centered, there you go, we're right dead over top of 106. So what this means is our receiver is peaked and the dial accuracy is correct. Everything is good. Now we should be able to do a little bit of testing to see the sensitivity of our, of our tuner. And really what we want to look for is the, uh, you know, putting in a very low signal and being able to pick something up. So that's what we're going to do next. If you turn this up, you can very clearly hear the signal. But what we want is we want to see how far down we can get this. And I usually do this center dial, which is somewhere around 98 megahertz. And we'll go to 98 megahertz. And you can see I just dialed it right on to 98, and boom, everything came right in perfect. And now we're going to just reduce our signal and see how far we can go and still be able to receive it. What we really want to see is somewhere around that uh, one, mi one to two microvolts, something like that. So let's do that. Okay, going down, and you can see there's some static. And we're going to get right on that signal perfectly so that the way you know you're tuned properly is when you have a staticky signal, the static should be equal on top and bottom. That means you're centered on the station very well. So right there is 50 microvolts. I'm sorry, 500 microvolts. And there is 50 microvolts. And if we listen, you can still hear that signal in there, which is a good thing. So, I'm sorry, it's not 50 microvolts, it's 5 microvolts. So we're right at 5 microvolts, and if we go down to about 3 microvolts, you can still just barely hear it. And 3 microvolts for an FM tuner that is kind of, this is a medium end, this is not considered a high end sensitive tuner, picking up 
three microvolts and just still being able to hear the signal at all is pretty good. So I'm satisfied with this. If this were, for instance, our Pioneer TX9800, uh, it would probably go down into the dirt even further and be able to pick up the audio. But for what this is, excellent, excellent performance. You know, it's only a little three gang tuner, so <laughs> that's not too bad. Now, the last thing we want to check is our multiplex or our stereo signal. And with FM multiplex, anytime you go into stereo mode, the sensitivity of the receiver goes way down. So where we were picking out a signal at somewhere around five microvolts, we're actually going to have to go to about 100 to 150 microvolts to get a fairly decent uh, FM stereo signal. Now, I can go way down and still get a stereo signal, but it's going to be crackly and noisy. A nice, clear sounding with no static signal, as you can hear, a wee little bit of static, not much, is going to be somewhere around 100 to 150 microvolts. That's just the nature of how FM multiplex stereo works. So the first thing we want to do is we want to check all of the different functions. So we have normal stereo, we have left plus right which is going to be mono, we have left minus right which is going to show your left and right if it's tuned properly, if everything's adjusted properly they should be exactly 180 degrees out of phase from one another and you can see they are. Then we can go to right channel only and the left channel should be a flat line or as close to a flat line as possible and we want to go to left channel only which I'm not syncing on that channel that's why it's jiggling around but you can see once again the right channel should now be a flat line. Now if they're not a flat line we can adjust that by adjusting the FM multiplex section. We'll do that next. I'll show you. Even though it's not bad, we'll see if we can get it a little flatter. So to adjust stereo separation, we're going to adjust this little pot right here called RV202. And this is on the schematic, if I back up a little bit, this is going to be right here at the very end of your discriminator circuit right there stereo separation adjustment and when we get that that should be able to allow this to work very well as far as flattening that that channel so I'm going to adjust that I'm going to move you over to the scope and we'll see what, what we can do all right we're back on the scope and let's just move this and see if we can get it any better. Oh, see, we went over it. This pot's a little bit dirty. And you can see when you go past it, you can kind of see where, uh, where it moves, you know, where it starts to get curvature. See there? See how now you're bleeding over into that other channel? So the idea is to get maximum amplitude here and maximum flatness here. And right there, moving around on the noise. We're getting it right in. And there you go. It's pretty flat now. So, and then we can go to the other channel and just make sure it's the same. And let's uh, move our trigger over to channel two. And you can see it's nice and flat. And this one's nice and smooth looking. So there's our stereo. Everything looks good. Willie, one. And there we go. Not going to get a lot of stations down here in the basement too well, but.
Not bad. So, it's working just fine. So the only thing left to do now is the AM, and that's going to be pretty easy. We'll go through that real quick, and this receiver is done. AM alignment is pretty straightforward on this thing, so I keep it pretty simple. <laughs> I have a coil of wire, it's just a few turns, and it's really nothing special, it's not tuned, anything like that. And I correct, connect it directly to the output of my signal generator. And we're going to adjust two different frequencies. We're going to adjust our 600 kilohertz, and we're going to adjust our uh, 1.4 megahertz, or 1400 kilohertz. So, bottom of the dial, top of the dial type thing. There's really not a lot of adjustment to this thing. Everything is done by an integrated circuit. So if you look at this little chip right down here, your entire AM tuning section is handled by that chip. And you have two alignment coils here, which happen to be for your oscillator mixer circuits. And then you have your capacitors here and then you actually have the little ferrite core in the antenna here and the easiest way to do this is to just introduce a signal you just loosely couple a signal from this coil onto the ferrite bar antenna I like doing this uh, better than actually plugging into the antenna input because I kinda like to simulate what the radio is doing when it's receiving a signal through the bar antenna. And so there's no hard and fast rule for doing this. You start out by turning on your signal generator and we're going to go up here and we're just going to set it to 600 kilohertz like that. And I have five millivolts. Now that sounds like a ton of energy, but you have to understand this is not a matched circuit. This coil right here is directly connected to the output of the signal generator. So really your radiated power is a lot different than what what that millivolt input or output is from your signal generator. So you just move it in close proximity and you can hear the static and all we're going to do is we're going to go down here and you can see right there we're right on 600 kilohertz and you can hear the signal now AM especially on my bench with all the switch mode power supplies and all the garbage floating around on here you're going to pick up a little bit of background noise that's to be expected so all we're going to do, and I can tell you it really doesn't need anything done, is we're going to adjust these, and then we're going to adjust these little trimmer capacitors when we get up to our 1400 kilohertz. And you can see each capacitor, like I said earlier, these smaller, the ones with more plates, are actually for the lower frequency band, which would be the AM. So it would be this trimmer, this trimmer, and this trimmer right here. So you have the FM is the wider ones, the AM is the smaller ones, or tighter together ones, more plates. And that's really all there is to it. So first thing we'll do is we'll go down and we'll check and make sure these are peaked, but I'm pretty sure they are. So here we go. And again, I'm looking at the tape recorder outputs of the receiver just because I really don't like listening to all that noise. Now, I'll turn it up to listen to what it sounds like, but you can see pretty clearly uh, there's a little bit of warbliness, and that's the garbage floating around on my bench uh, out there. But you can hear fairly decent. And if we adjust those two coils, you can see... 
we can make it clearer and it's it was on it was pretty much on now we can turn it up and you can hear what I'm doing when I adjust it right about there huh that's pretty clear there and then we'll adjust the other one pretty good and that's all there is to it uh, now all we're going to do is we're going to go to the upper part of the band which would be our 1400 kilohertz which is right here and you can see right there we'll put it right on and we'll go up here and go to 1.4 megahertz and look at that <laughs> it just falls right in place. I didn't even touch anything. So this thing really doesn't need adjusted at all. It's it's pretty much right on. So there you go. That's the AM. I mean, it's really that simple. There, a lot of these 1970s, 1980s, uh, mostly the 1970s era receivers, the AM section is all done by an integrated circuit. And it really takes out a lot of the alignment process. That's why you normally don't see me do these on videos when I restore receivers because it's just so simple. There's not much to it. Now again, you can make it as complicated as you want. You can connect up, you know, you can you can sweep the coils with a sweep generator and a marker and you go through all that. And uh, what you'll find is after you go through it, it's really not a whole lot better. <laughs> than if you do it with this method. Um, but whatever floats your boat. So anyway, that part is done. The receiver is working fine. The amplifier is working fine. So really the only thing left to do now is uh, to do the quadraphonic section, which I'm kind of excited about because I really haven't messed around with quadraphonic very much, uh, to be honest. and. Uh, I'm going to have to think about this one before the next part of this video comes out because I really want to come up with some sort of way that I, of course I can't play any records that I have that are quad because it's all copyrighted material but maybe I can download some uh, files or something that are encoded in uh, SQ at least or um, maybe matrix or something like that but uh, and, we'll, and we'll talk about the different types of quadraphonic as well so uh, if you have anything to offer to that before I post the next video, please feel free to do that and we'll maybe talk about it a little bit more. So that ends this part of the series on the uh, Lafayette LR441. I am going to put something at the very end of this video that you can feel free to skip through. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about this antenna matching box or the uh, impedance matching box for my signal generator because I have always get questions on it and every so often I feel like I should <laughs> kind of repeat it a little bit so you don't have to go back and look at the old videos to see where I talked about it more. But anyway, that's it for now and I wish you all well. Peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. So a few, few times, and actually just on the video series before this one, the one where it wasn't even a series, the one on the SAE uh, Nixie tube tuner that I did, I actually used this little adapter box. And you can see it says in 50 ohms, out 75 ohms from, nine, from 88 to 108 megahertz. And what this is is an impedance matching box that I made up. And the purpose for this is that most standard RF signal generators are designed to have an accurate output when they're terminated at 50 ohms because most commercial broadcast equipment and so forth has 50 ohm termination for the antenna. So for instance like a CB radio, a ham radio, um, most of those kinds of things they're going to have a 50 ohm termination. So 
when you look at the output of your signal generator, you know, when you're talking about how many microvolts or how many dBm of output, that is only provided that you are using a 50 ohm termination at the end of the output of that signal generator. So what, what do I mean? Let me repeat it again <laughs> for those of you who are not real familiar about this. So here's my signal generator, the 8657. And if you look at the signal generator, and most signal generators are like this, you actually have the frequency that you set it to, and then you have the amplitude, the output amplitude. And you can see there's different units that you can uh, use. For instance, this is microvolts, millivolts, volts, and then electromotive force EMF, dBF, dBm. So all of those are F is femtowatts, M is milliwatt. And regardless of what unit of measurement you're using for the amplitude output, all of these are provided that you're connecting a 50 ohm termination. So if I hooked a 50 ohm resistor across the output between the output and ground, this would be the accurate amplitude if you were able to measure it. Now the problem that you run into is when we talk about radio like this, like FM and AM radios that are typically like your FM radio that you use for broadcast band, those have two different termination points. So you have a choice. You can have 300 ohm or you could have 75 ohm, but you cannot have 50 ohm. They just aren't designed that way. It's just the way it is. So, and, and that goes pretty much hand in hand with television. Television also uses 50 ohm, or I'm sorry, 75 ohm and 300 ohm termination. That's one of the reasons that they made FM radio that way so that you can use the antenna, uh, your VHF antenna, off of your television, for instance. It's close to the frequency of this. Um, so as a result, you can use those a lot of times. They'll have an, ele an extra element on them that you can connect your FM radio. So what happens if you're, you have your alignment instructions here and it tells you to connect all this stuff up and it tells you to set a specific output. Well there's two ways you can deal with it. You can connect your 50 ohm terminated or, or your 50 ohm dependent signal generator to the 75 ohm input here and you can do some math to convert what it is because there's actually a math formula that you can do that. But that gets kind of cumbersome. Every time you want to change the amplitude, you have to recalculate what you're actually getting into the 75 ohm. Now, there's little online calculators, and I even made a spreadsheet that has auto calculating cells in it, but that's still kind of a pain. So, what this does is we can make this little adapter box, and its whole purpose in life is to take that 50 ohm termination and make it or take that 75 ohm termination and make it look like a 50 ohm termination to your signal generator. So what actually is happening is when you use this in between your signal generator and your your FM tuner, you're actually whatever you see on that display is going to be very close to what's actually going into your radio. Now there will be little insertion losses and things that you can have, and we'll talk about that later. But for the most part, you can almost treat this as a one-to-one. -one. And the reason that it does it is because it actually uses a, uh, an, it's an LC, and it's called an L, or an L network on this one. So very simple. You start out with a little metal box. I like using a metal box, and these are connected to the metal box, so this whole thing is shielded. So this is all at ground with respect to your signal generator. And when you open it up, there's only two components. You have a very small coil, 
which you can see is only two turns. And this is three quarters of an inch, somewhere 18 to 20 millimeters in diameter. It's not super important. You can just take a, you know, a piece of dowel rod or metal or something just to, as a form and wrap that stiff wire. And this is just enameled copper wire. And it's heavier gauge. You can see it's maybe like uh, number 16 gauge or something like that. And it goes from here to here. So it's actually directly connecting from the input to the output. Then in addition to that, you have a capacitor that's connecting between the output and ground. And this capacitor is just in, in parallel with this capacitor. This trimmer capacitor didn't have enough capacity, so I had to add some capacitance to get it in range. And the name of the game here <laughs> is this coil's not super critical. If you use two turns of that three quarters of an inch diameter, 20 millimeters diameter, somewhere around there, a little bit bigger, a little smaller, won't hurt it. You put that in there and you put your capacitor in there and this capacitor just happens to be this is uh this is a 22 picofarad and i think this one here is uh i think it's like a 400 picofarad or something like that and what you do is you connect a 75 ohm resistor across this end and then you can measure it with a very sensitive, like a, you can use a spectrum analyzer if you have one. You can also use an RF voltmeter if you have one. It has to be really super high impedance. <laughs> and if you use your spectrum analyzer, again, you'll have to use an adapter because spectrum analyzers present a 50 ohm load. So you have to keep that all in mind. But the best thing to use would be like a uh, RF voltmeter or something like that. And what you're going to do is you're going to set it to about the middle of the bandwidth. So if we're going from 88 to 108, I'm going to set it to 98 megahertz. And then what you're going to do is you're going to put a, a set output on your signal generator. Let's say, I don't know, let's say uh, one millivolt, for instance, or let's say 50, you know, 50 microvolts, something like that, or 100 microvolts, some, something that, you, that your test equipment is capable of measuring. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to measure that, and at first, it will be completely out to lunch. It will not, what, what's going in here is not what's coming out here across your 75 ohm load. It'll be wrong. But what will happen is by adjusting your little trimmer capacitor, and by stretching and bending this coil open and closed, you will. that's why you never want to move this after it's set. You notice I have it kind of siliconed in place. But once you do that between this and moving the distance of this coil, you will get it to a point where you'll have exactly the same amplitude of output as you do input. And it's just going to convert the uh, the the impedance. Now what's going to happen is since you have a metal case as soon as you put this on this actually adds capacitance to the circuit and therefore it's going to throw it back off so that's where the the finickiness comes. <laughs> you have to open it move it a little bit like a little bit beyond what you want put the cover back on test it and it'll take two or three tries to get it but eventually you'll get it perfect. Then when you screw this back on, you'll have a pretty accurate input versus output amplitude. You'll have a little bit of insertion loss. And insertion loss is basically a resistance and, and some uh, reactive component that will cause you to drop a little bit of signal. But you'll find out as long as you're within that frequency range, it'll drop about the same amount across the board no matter what you have. Um, so this one has very, very, very little loss. Now, some of you might be saying to yourselves right now, well, they make these things. Why the heck would you make one? Well, first of all, 
you could see you can build this out of scrap parts you have around a piece of wire and a trimmer cap but more importantly let's uh let's get one of these out i do have the commercial adapters so here's one right here and you can see it has 50 ohms on one side and 75 ohms on the other side and it's good from DC to 2 gigahertz or 2000 megahertz but the problem you're going to run into with this is see what I wrote on there they don't tell you this you have to look it up on the spec sheet whatever whatever uh, DBM output you have you have to or whatever DBM input you have here you're going to have 5.7 dBm less coming out so this actually has a built-in attenuation that's how it does the trick so it's really it's really more of a resistive load than it is a reactive load so that's why these are okay if you're working with DB but what happens is if you're working with volts instead of DBm you'll see that this still isn't going to be accurate all the time. You're still going to have to try to calculate things. So it works, and they work great, you know, all the way from DC to 2 gigahertz, but you still are going to have some insertion loss, a lot of insertion loss with these. Whereas with this one, you have almost no loss. It's almost a one-to-one -one transfer because of the reactive nature of that LC circuit. So that's why I prefer this one. I have these. I use them in certain things, especially when I'm working with DB. It, it's, a, it's not that bad. You can kind of just subtract the DB and it, it's perfect. But this is whatever it says on your, on your signal generator. That's what's going into your FM tuner. And a good one of these, you know, from a reputable company like Mini Circuits or other companies like that, you, they can cost... A good bit of money um, they're not really cheap so anyway I just thought I would show you all that once again and then all you do is you have your 50 ohm cable going into your signal generator and then you use a 75 ohm cable which yes the cables are important too um, my output cable right here let's see if I can show it to you <laughs> all of the writing is pretty much scrubbed off this is a 75 ohm cable and the cable that I'm feeding into it is a 50 ohm cable and there are such things so as long as you keep the, the correct cables and use this it works really well I hope that kinda explains what this box was when you guys saw this I know um, I did a whole video on impedance matching your test equipment to uh, your device under test and uh, I'll try to remember to put a link to it somewhere here on the video but that's what this is all about um, I have to kind of repeat myself a lot because if new new people to the channel come on and they subscribe they don't usually they don't always go back and look at some of the older videos and a lot of these videos I did a couple years ago or whatever and they kind of get buried <laughs> when you get more than 200 videos posted it starts to get kind of uh, hard to find things so uh, I find myself having to repeat some of this stuff so I hope you don't mind me taking a little bit of your time to go over this again and uh, now we'll get back to our original thing and one last quick note is when you buy a specific piece of test equipment made for FM stereo they will have all of that already built in so if you look here you can see this one already has a 75 ohm termination so all I do is take this 75 ohm cable run it right into the back of the radio and you're all set and if you want to go into the 300 ohm uh, you can just use a standard 300 ohm matching ballon you know something like like this here and it just screws into your 75 ohm cable here and you have 300 ohms out here and you can connect that right into your tuner so it's really convenient when you have something like this Sencor SG80 um, most of these purposely built uh, signal generators for 
AM FM broadcast are going to have 75 ohm and some of them even have 300 ohm outputs whereas the ones that are designed you know laboratory grade signal generators they're all going to be 50 ohms like this one is 50 ohms that one up here the Keithley or I mean the fluke it's 50 ohms so all of those are 50 ohms my my spectrum analyzer 50 ohm termination on the input 50 ohm output on the tracking generator you can even see right on there 50 ohms they all say that so uh, just something to remember it, it will bite you if you don't think about it and you'll wonder why the alignment isn't going properly and it's because you have a mismatch of your test equipment to the device that you're connecting it to and you're getting a, a discrepancy on your actual signal amplitude